This is something that I've wanted for quite some time now and today I finally managed to get one. Uh, it's a Commodore PET 2001, um, 8K of RAM, UK model, um, quite an early one, I think probably somewhere around 77, 78. And the reason I've wanted one of these for so long is because I'm in my late 40s now and when I was a child, my father, who sadly passed away now, but he was well into fixing televisions and electronics and loved computers and uh, space flight. And he was generally interested in all that kind of stuff. Um, sometime around 1978, 79, he bought one of these, very similar, um, obviously in much better condition because he bought it new, but um, different tape deck. The one that he got had white keys um, whereas this one's got black ones. I think this is a slightly earlier model. Um, or perhaps they just ran out of uh, tape decks with white keys. Who knows? Um, but brought it home and it sat in the corner of the front room in our house, in our little terraced house. And uh, to me, it was just, it was magical. It was just amazing. I'd never seen anything like it in my life before. Obviously, I mean, this is recognisable as a TV and a it looked to me like a calculator at the time uh, and anybody uh, who's our age recognises a tape deck but a computer I didn't really know what one was um, and the great thing about these is uh, or the bad thing about these is I suppose it depends on your point of view is that when you turn one of these on there's no real um, operating system there's no windows comes up there's uh, yeah, nothing much of anything comes up really just uh, a flashing cursor and a little bit of text and um, that's it you have to program everything in yourself or load it through the tape deck um, so by today's standards it's very primitive it only has 8k of ram and that's not 8 megabytes or 8 gig of ram that's 8k uh, it's an absolutely minuscule amount of ram and uh, the first 1k of that ram is reserved for the um, uh, the computer itself so you've actually got about 7K of usable RAM. So very limited in what you can do with it. Uh, it's mostly a business machine, really. You can play some games on it. There's a Space Invaders game and there's a, some Star Trek games and uh, various bits and bobs. Um, I think they're probably all available online now, so I'll have a look later. Um, but yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, show you, uh, I'll show you around it. And first thing I'll do is... Uh, just show you this keyboard. So the first thing you're going to notice about this keyboard is that it's probably unlike any keyboard you've ever seen before. Um, and I think it's quite cute. Uh, I, I quite like looking at it, but it is horrible to use. If you're used to um, a traditional typewriter style keyboard, which is what you find on any single computer uh, that you buy these days, um, even on your mobile phone, the, the keys are arranged in a, a typewriter format. Um, this one isn't. Um, this seems to have taken its inspiration from a calculator uh, and it's basically impossible to touch type on this keyboard. You have to look at the keys as you're typing, um, which, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite something. No space bar. Uh, this key up here, you might think that's the backspace key, but no, that's just the back arrow key. Um, backspace, if I recall correctly, is delete up here. Um, this key called return is the enter key. It's called return because on a typewriter, the carriage return would be a great big lever that would put you on the next line. So they've just shortened it to return the um, <clears throat> graphics on each key, which are accessed by if I remember, I think you use the shift keys to get to these um, these little graphics. Um, and those are the only graphics the machine is capable of producing. You can't, um, you know, there's no sprites. So there's no, uh, you can't sort of create bitmap graphics or anything like that. You are stuck with those shapes that you see on that keyboard. And it being a very low resolution machine as well, there isn't a great deal that you can draw. But, you know, as a... As a child of uh, seven or eight years old, um, that was more than enough for me. I could draw all kinds of things with those keys. 
Um, but uh, this one's got some damage. The uh, AND key seems not to be coming back up. It may just be stuck or the spring may have broken. Um, but I'll have to pull it apart. Uh, I want to clean it all up anyway and just get rid of all this embedded grime. No floppy drive on this machine. No SD card slots, no compact flash card slots, nothing like that. Just a simple tape player and actually it records as well. Um, this, uh, although it says Commodore, it's got the Commodore logo on here and I think there's a, probably a Commodore label missing from the, uh, the lid as well. This is actually a rebranded re uh, cassette machine, I think from Taiwan. Um, you can find details of it online. Uh, I'll show you the underside in a sec, but um, yep, essentially if you wanted to load a program or record something you'd written, this is what you'd use. Um, to load a program, you simply open using the stop eject button, which hopefully isn't working. That could just be stuck down with years of grime or perhaps a lever's broken. Um, press play when um, prompted to by the computer. Got rewire, sorry, fast forward. Key's broken there. I think there's a little crack there, so that requires some attention. Rewind. And the record key, which won't work at the moment because there's no cassettes in there. So, how does one get inside the Commodore PET? Thankfully, it's pretty easy. There's uh, two screws, one on this side, one on that side. And you simply lift it up. And just like in a car, there's a bonnet stick. It's a bit stiff on this one. Pop it in the hole. And there we go. Internally, it may look very complicated, but actually it's quite simple. We have, on this side here, we have a transformer, smoothing capacitor. We have a keyboard connector here. Uh, now there's a uh, power supply for the board. Somewhere, there's the tape interface there and we have a video feed for the monitor if I remember correctly and coming off the back of the transformer there's a power feed for the monitor as well and uh, down here is the brains so we have the processor here um, these two banks of chips here are the memory they're a common point of failure on this uh, computer and they're no longer made so they can be a bit tricky to find um, tricky equaling expensive but there are replacements um, available and there's two video ram chips up here as well i think those are the video ram chips identical so it's good to have those because they're a good way of uh, fault finding if you have any um, memory problems or any video problems you can simply swap them over and uh, see what changes so to speak but i'm not going to touch any of this this isn't going to see any power until i've checked to see if the correct voltage is coming out of that transformer and if this uh, these uh, this rectifier circuit is working correctly as well um, to do that I need to get a fuse in the back of the machine unfortunately the fuse holder uh, is only half there so I need to buy a new panel fuse holder from somewhere um, before I can start doing any testing on this so um, yeah so it'll be uh, Few days before I can sort that out and then I'll start uh, measuring voltages and uh, checking uh, everything looks okay before I uh, consider powering it on to see if it works. The owner, the guy I bought it from, um, a very nice gentleman up in Middlesbrough um, who's got some very interesting computers uh, that I'd never seen before actually. Um, he said he had it powered on a few years ago and that it worked but uh, he tried it recently and there was nothing, well, I mean, there's, it's not going to work without a fuse in it, full stop. Um, but uh, no, you wouldn't just put a fuse in it and turn it on to see if it works because the whole thing could go kaboom um, if there's a problem on it. So check the power supply first and then we can see if the board uh, works.